Thank you for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to talk about Gandhara. It's actually something that I've always wanted to do work on, and it wasn't until excavating 30 years at Harappa, I had the opportunity to move, to move a little bit north and start working on sites in the Peshawar region and also in Taxila. So I was invited by Dr. Abdul Samad, who is the Director General of Archaeology of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, to work with him and Hazara University at a site called Bamala. So I'll be talking about Bamala Stupa. Uh, Dr. Samad, Dr. Uh, Muhammad Hamid, and Dr. Shakirullah were the ones who were directing the project, and I and some colleagues from India came in as, as um, collaborators. So um, the first slide here shows a picture of what a real Gandhara sculpture looked like with the color on it. This is from the Lahore Museum. It's been actually conserved, so it's been some colors have been added to it today, recent, recently. And then an intaglio seal showing Gaja Lakshmi, Lakshmi being bathed by elephants, uh, carved in garnet that was found in Bamala Stupa. So these are things that you've probably never seen before relating to Gandharan art. So I thought I would start off by showing you how it's so different and it's how rich Gandhara is and the diversity of material that we're going to be talking about today. Um, today I want to cover a little bit of chronology. So I'm sure that most people don't have a really good understanding of the chronology of this region. It's taken me many, many years to even understand it. And even archaeologists today have a hard time. And one of the things that I take away from it is that there is a kichuri. Kichuri is a mixture of rice and dal and spices cooked together to make a very, very nutritious type of food. So the Northwest has always been considered to be a crossroads, but it's actually more than a crossroads. So if you have enough crossing, it becomes a core. So this is a crossroad that is also a core region that has been the foundation of South Asian culture. That's what we consider to be India today, or ancient India. It's the foundations of Hinduism, of Buddhism, of Jainism, and it also links back to the Paleolithic period. And so I'm gonna give you a sense of this through the talk today. And a lot of this work has been done by scholars before me, so this is not all my work. I'm going to try to acknowledge them when I get to that, because I have only recently started working in Gandhara. So Gandhara is not just a crossroads. It is a crossroads, because it's at a major juncture point between South Asia, Central Asia, West Asia. But it's also a core region that itself produced new material that was then spread throughout the subcontinent. And then I'll end by talking about why Gandhara is important to the archaeology and cultural traditions of Pakistan and India, as well as South Asia in general. So the earlier talk was about the Indus civilization. And the Indus civilization focused only on the, Gange, the Indus plain, which is bordered to the ed edge of the Ganges. But this discussion is going to call, I call it the Indo-Gangetic tradition. So it's the Indus and the Ganga region together combined to create a larger sphere of influence. And it starts at the end of the Indus, and the end of the Indus is actually the beginning of this process. So there's a very big overlap, which I won't go into today, but I'll give you examples of the connections between the two. We call this early period a regionalization era when people begin to interact in different regions and new structures and networks develop. Archaeologists refer to this as a period of early chiefdoms and city-states. The literature that we have from the sacred literature of South Asia, the Vedas, refer to this as a Vedic period. So this is the Vedic period of ancient South Asia. But we also have non-Vedic communities that we know are present. And they are referred to in the Vedas, which are texts. And those communities were surrounding this area. The main focus of the region of the Vedas is the Sapta Sindha, which is the seven rivers, goes from the Ganga to the Kabul River, including the five rivers of the, Indus, of the, the, the Punjab. Um, the integration is when all of this comes together into a big urban phase. That happens during the Mauryan period. So the first Chandragupta Maurya was the first ruler to integrate all of northern India and Pakistan and Afghanistan into one state. And he did this with warfare, very brutal, and his son Ashoka was equally brutal, but then Ashoka converted to Buddhism or attributed his change of policy to Buddhism. We don't know if he actually became a Buddhist, 
but he said nobody should kill each other, they should be peaceful, and he used made it a state policy that everybody should follow these traditions. He was followed by the Kushana dynasty, which is an important dynasty. The Kushana dynasty is normally associated with Gandharan art, but Gandhara is actually much older than the Kushana period, and it goes back to the early period. So what I'm going to try to present to you is the origins of so-called Gandharan art that start much earlier and continue on into this time period. I won't be talking about the Gupta. Um, so this area, based on the Vedas, the sacred texts of the, uh, of the Vedic period, which are the Rig Veda, the Sama Veda, the Yajur Veda, the Atharva Veda, these four texts became the foundation of what is later considered to be Hinduism, Brahmanic Hinduism. And their later texts, the Upanishads, and then eventually the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. But the Vedas that we have preserved were actually memorized in the far regions of the Ganga and passed down to us. So there are only four texts out of thousands probably of other Vedas that are no longer present. So just keep that in mind. The texts were being created here by communities living in this area called Saptasindha, from the Kabul River to the Ganga. So this entire region, which is Harappa, is right in the middle of it, is kind of links to what we talked about earlier. So this is the northern part of the Indus Valley. It's where we have cities that you know have their foundations at 4000 BC, and even go back earlier to the Paleolithic. And I'm going to show you how that works in the Taxila Valley. Eventually, we know that there were many city-states developing. And the texts that we have are mainly Buddhist texts and Jain texts. And then we have the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, which talk about events that were happening in the Ganga region, the Ganga Doa, the Ganga Jamuna region. So that's why we know all the names of every city on the Ganga and the Jamuna. We know some of the major cities in central India, Ujjain, we know a few of them in the south, but this all this region was called Barbara by the people in the Ganga. They called it Barbara because they didn't know anything about it. And it was a region that was still very powerful, and the cities of the Ganga could not conquer this region because this region was ruled by different kinds of groups. That we know what they were, they were non-monarchical cities. So this region was still controlled by lots of people. It was very heavily populated, but the people in the Ganga could not conquer it. And they called it Barbara. It's like calling everybody else foreigners, and we're Americans, OK? That's, that's basically what was happening. But Taxila is at the northern part of this Barbara region. And we know the names of these areas, because those areas are, if you go back to this slide, it's called Gandhari which is right up here in the, in the Vedas. And later it's called Gandhara. And it goes from Kabul to the Peshawar Valley and Taxila. And Taxila is one of the largest cities of Gandhara. These polities in the, in the Ganga and then some that we have mention of in, the, in this region are called Mahajanapada. Mahajanapada, mean, Mahajanapada means a big group of people, which is a big polity. And they were the big states that were developing. So. The main developments of texts are among the people living in the Ganga, Jamuna, Yodhidoa, Mahabharata, Ramayana, and the giant and Buddhist texts, which happened for, because a guy named Mahavira happened to live in a place called Vaishali over here, or Banaras, and then um, Buddha lived in another area just further, a bit further to the, to the uh, east. So, the Jain religion is one of the earliest religions that we have a good documentation for in South Asia, in addition to Brahmanical Vedic traditions. And I just got a huge package of Jain texts from a guy in India who says, the Jains are actually the oldest religion that goes back to the Indus Valley civilization. And I agree with him. Because the foundations of the Jain religion can be dated back to the first saint called Adinath. And Adinata is the first one, and they consider this is the beginning of the saintly tradition that leads up to Jainism. The 23rd reincarnation of Adinatha 
was born in Benares, and we know that that dated to around 800 BC. So Benares is in the Ganga Yamuna Yoto. The, the 24th is a guy named Mahavira, Vardhamana Mahavira, and he was born at Vaishali. So Vaishali is a big city state in the, in the southern Gangetic region. So his religious tradition followed the concept of ahimsa, or nonviolence, of renouncing of all pleasures, of basically not having sex, and not procreating, and eventually gaining immortality, or moksha, release from this worldly reincarnation cycle. It's a very strict and hard religion to follow. But there are many different ways to follow it. Okay? So giants today are some of the biggest merchants and very powerful communities in South Asia and abroad. And some of them fast until they die, and they get release. So this religion is still practiced today in South Asia, and its foundation is, goes back to this early time period. So the period of early states sees the spread of Jainism from the Ganges to South India to other regions. It also sees the development of Buddhism. And Buddhism is a, some, some people say it's an offshoot of these other concepts, but other people argue that it's a set, totally separate process. It also has a very long history. Before Buddha, the stories of Buddha before he became Buddha are found in texts. They tell about his life in previous incarnations and help us understand the history of this region. So Buddhist traditions talk about compassion, right action, right thought, the middle way, how you don't have to fast till you die, but you can still be there to help other people and you can be compassionate. And there's lots of different traditions that are emerging. So Jainism, Brahmanical Hinduism, and Buddhism, all three contribute to the milieu that was present in this region. And they all were happening in the same cities the same ritual areas, the same pilgrimage places throughout most of North India up to the, up to the, up to the decade. Um, and this was happening, you know, 800, 1200 BC, all the way up until after the death of Buddha. Northern subcontinent, the Indus Valley, was such a prosperous region that it was sending textiles, gold, commodities, crafts, to the Iranian consumers. And the rulers of Iran wanted their silks, they wanted their cottons, they wanted their beautiful um, jewelry, they wanted all this stuff, and they got tired of paying their taxes on it and paying for the trip shipping, so they decided to conquer the Indus Valley. You don't take an army from Persepolis across the Hindu Kush mountains and into a region just to conquer a bunch of shepherds. You do it to conquer the cities that are producing the most valuable things in your world. And the, the duty that the Iranians made the Indians pay was pure gold. They said, you're going to pay taxes in pure gold. All other parts of the Iranian Achaemenid Empire paid in commodities. Slaves, textiles, oil, anything else. But the Indus Valley had so much gold, they only paid in pure gold dust. And that's because the Indus merchants decided, We'll give you all the gold you want. Just go away and we'll take care of ourselves. So the Achaemen is claimed they conquered the Indus Valley. And they did with an army, but they didn't stay there. So they went away. And we have very little evidence for Achaemen architecture or Achaemen culture or Achaemen pottery or Achaemen artifacts, because everything is local. So this was done in 559 BC by Kurush, by Daryabush, by Sharyabasha. These are the three rulers that three times they had to conquer it because people stopped paying taxes, so they had to come and send an army again to do it. So that means that this region was extremely wealthy. Extremely wealthy with all kinds of commodities, and this was the core of what was happening in South Asia. Not the Ganga, but the northern Indus Valley. Now the Iranians had developed a, a, a very big script. They have a writing system. But the version that we see that starts spreading into this part of the world is called Kharoshti. It's written from right to left. And it's the way in which people were writing in the eastern part of the Achaemenid Empire. On the other side, they were using still cuneiform, because they were using old cuneiform as a form of, of writing. But here, they started developing a form called Kharoshti. So this is the expanse of the Iranian Empire. 
uh, Achaemenid Empire. So they controlled everything from Turkey to the Indus Valley, parts of the Indus Valley, sorry. And then even on into uh, the Near East and then parts of uh, almost to Egypt. So they controlled a huge area. So when Alexander the Great, and my name, Sikandar, didn't really come in Harappa. It was given to me when I was working in Balochistan because nobody wanted to say Jonathan Mark. And Mark in Urdu means to hit. So I didn't want people calling me Mark. Okay? It means I'm going to hit you all the time. Um, so anyway, so Alexander came and fought a couple battles and eventually chased the Darius and killed him, or he was killed by his, his own people. And then eventually he heard that there was a king that Darius had sent a letter to had said, please send me your elephant so that I can beat this foreigner, meaning Alexander. So the Achaemenid ruler had sent a message to King Porus, not Porus, to King Umbi and rulers in, the, in this valley to help him fight this guy. Alexander's spies caught that message. So Alexander was very petrified that there was somebody going to be coming with a big army of elephants from India to fight him. And elephants were like the, the you know, laser bombs and tanks of the modern world. And he decided that I'm going to chase Darius, and that's when Darius was killed. And all this time, he started worrying about this king in this guy area that had big elephants. When the king in the Indus Valley, uh, in Umbi, found that Darius had been killed, he just turned around and went back. So Alexander came to the Indus Valley not to see the end of the world, like the Greeks said, but to worry about his flank and a very big, powerful ruler who had lots of elephants. And he fought his way very carefully all the way down to this area. And he eventually ended up in the Punjab. He got Umbi, the king of, of Charsada, a Peshawar area, to um, or to uh, help him, and then he went to, to Umbi, the king of Taxila. Taxila king said, okay, I'm going to help you. And then, guess what king of Taxila said? There's a really bad king across the river. His name is Horus. Can you help me go fight him? And Alexander had to re get his troops together, and they went to see if they can get Horus, and Horus had a bigger army and many more elephants than Umbi. And they spent several months trying to negotiate the river. And finally, they got into a battle. And they fought all day long. And at the end of the battle, who do you think won? The Greeks said that Alexander won. And the Greek text is the main text. But there's a Persian text, there's an Egyptian text. And the Greeks don't like those texts because those texts tell a different story. We know that Alexander went and lived with Porus after the battle. If you conquer somebody, do you go live with them? You kill them. You destroy their city. He did that with every city between Macedonia and the Indus Valley. But when he conquered Porus, all of a sudden, you're such a great man. I'm going to sit down with you. I'm going to give you back your kingdom, and we're going to be friends. Does that work? No. So really what happened was that there was either a truce or Porus won. And Porus wanted him to kind of fight another king down the Ganges called Nanda Raja, a Nanda king. So Alexander was sticking around with Porus after this huge battle. Thousands of people died. Porus allowed him to get re-supplied. Um, so he said, yeah, get, get some more weapons, get some more armor, get some more stuff. And now, go get that guy. Go get that guy. Go get that guy. He, Porus had Alexander fighting every one of his enemies in the entire Punjab until his own army said, we're not going to do this anymore. We're going to go home. They rebelled, and then they hightailed it out of there. So they didn't just leave nicely. They ran away. Half the army went to Afghanistan, and half the army went as fast as they could down the Indus, and they were fighting the whole way. When they got to the, end of the edge of the Indus, they got boats. Half of them went by land, half of them went by boats, and they went back. So actually, Alexander, the myth of Alexander needs to be reconstructed. Because Alexander did, was not the first Greek to come to this region. The Achaemenids had already brought Greeks here. And when the Achaemenid rulers were fighting in Anatolia, in Ionia, the Greeks that they conquered, sorry, 
the best thing to do in antiquity and ancient rulers was to take, replace people in different regions. So they took Greeks from Macedonia, from uh, An from uh, Anatolia, and they brought them and put them in the Punjab at a place called Sialkot, modern city of Sialkot. And they said, "Now, be farmers here. You don't know the language, you don't know the culture, but pay taxes." And they took Punjabis from the Punjab and they put them on the front lines when they were fighting the Greeks in Anatolia. So they basically brought people from two sides of the world together during this time period. So when Alexander actually came to the Punjab and he met the people in Sialkot, they didn't like him because they're Ionians. They didn't like Macedonians. Ionians and Macedonians don't like each other that much. So they didn't welcome him. He wasn't a welcome Greek. So this is an example of global cosmopolitanism already happening at this time period, 300 BC. So anyway, Alexander came. He did not make a whole lot of influence. There were already Greeks there. There were Greeks in Iran. There were Greeks in Central Asia. And his group of people left very soon after he, died, after he was gone. So he left some garrisons there, supposedly. They were immediately decimated, and they were gone. The people who stayed there who were Greek were Indo-Greek. They were Greeks who had already been there during the Achaemenid period, who had intermarried with local people, who had adopted some of the local religion, and they had been there for generations, probably. We know that Greek culture was present, and Greek ways of presenting things were different than the art of South Asia, because the Greeks put their faces on their coins. South Asian rulers never did. So these are some of the later Greeks. We know that the Chandragupta Maurya became in control, and he controlled the region of Taxila shortly afterwards. We also know that other fluctuations happened in Iran and different religious traditions and, uh, develop, were developing in that region. And we know that there were Greek kings or Indo-Greek kings in, in Bactria and Central Asia who then established themselves and their uh, political power and also artistic traditions. So at this time, we have a new player coming in. And by about 165 BC to 135 BC, the emperor of China emerges all the way on the other side of the world and starts pushing out communities that were nomads in China. And one of those communities is called Yue Qi. And this Yue Qi are what we call Kushana today. So the Yue Qi were being pushed out of China. They ended up coming into Central Asia, conquering some of the Indo-Greek rulers there. And eventually, they came and controlled northern Afghanistan. And guess what they saw just over the hill? The rich in this valley. And they realized that we can sit here and control the entire wealth of the subcontinent on the Silk Route by controlling Afghanistan and the northern in this valley. So they eventually conquered that region as well. So the Kushana rulers came into Kabul. They came down to the Indus Valley. They conquered this area. And they brought with them a different style of clothing. So the kaftan, the shalwar. A lot of these things that we see today and we think of as being South Asian are actually coming in from Central Asia or East Asia. And what I've been trying to show you is that there's a lot of overlap going on from Greece to China to Central Asia. It's no longer South Asia. It's not just the pure region of one culture. It's now a mixture of global interactions. And this is an example of a statue found in Matra, which is on the Jamuna River in the core area of the Ganga Jamuna region, dressed with this kaftan and pointed shoes and a big sword. This is a, a statue of the ruler Kanishka. But one thing the Kushana did was they allowed all different religious groups and artistic groups to thrive, and they promoted them. So when they made coins, they put their face on one side, but then they put the god of another religious tradition on the other. So they have Iranian gods, they have different South Asian gods, they have Buddha on them. So they have all these things on one side and then their face on the other. And these coins were minted to mimic Roman coinage weights. That way their coins did not have to be melted down when they got traded with the Roman Empire. This is really smart economic policy. It means that you can trade your coins back and forth and use gold coins from the Roman Empire at the same time and you have a very good economic interaction. So these are examples of different gods and deities of different religious traditions on the coins of the Kushana period. And then the, the beginning of this happened during the Mauryan period when they first started trading, and then the Kushana expanded it 
all into this huge global Silk Road network that connects to the sea and also connects over land. And at the point of the most interaction is Taxila. So Taxila is the city that started out, actually we have evidence of 500,000 year old stone tools at Taxila. They were found in the excavations, but nobody talks about them. So they were hand axes from the Paleolithic period that were present in the ancient site. So people were living here during the Paleolithic. And people continued on into the early Harappan. There are no Harappan sites in this region because we think that this area might have been flooded or blocked by the Indus River by a, a landslide, and it was not habitable. So we have no Harappan sites for about 500, 700 years in this area. But then right after that, we see the establishment of cities. And those cities are at Taxila itself. And the earlier excavators, if you've ever read early reports, date the Earth City to about you know, 300 to 500 BC, but that's wrong. New excavations by the Pakistani archaeologists show it to go to 1100 BC. That overlaps with the Harappan period, the late Harappan period. Taxila main mound called Bir Mound is the earliest occupation. It's the pre-Achaemenid to the Achaemenid to the Mauryan. And then they shipped to the city here. This was a suburb at one time, and then it became the city during the Indo-Greek period. And then it moved here to the Kushana period to Sirsuk. And then finally was being was destroyed by the Hunna communities that came in about 480, 480 to 500. And Islamabad is just over the hill. So this area has been inhabited since 500,000 years ago. And it's an important trade network that links the north and south and east and west. The excavations that show the early period were done by Bahadur Khan, a Department of Archaeology excavator, and they found these early dates and were able to date it now because we have radiocarbon dating techniques that they didn't have before. The cities, the layout is very similar to the Harappan cities. They had wide streets, they had wells, they had drains, they had very similar facilities. So there's a lot of overlap from the Harappan period into this early time period. And Ashoka, when he was, so Chandragupta Maurya was his father. He conquered all of North India. He became uh, a very powerful ruler. And he sent his son Ashoka to be governor of Taxila when he, before he became king. So, and Taxila was where all the kings of the Ganga would send their children to, to go to school. It was like the Oxford or the Cambridge. They would give their child a thousand gold pieces, two sandals, and one umbrella. The sandals were so you could walk all the way there, and one would wear out, and you wear the other one. And the gold pieces were to pay for your tuition once you got to Taxila. You spent 12 years in Taxila, learning the Vedas, learning archery, learning all the sciences. And then you had to spend four years as an intern, traveling around. So Ashoka actually went down to Ujjain for a while, and he became a governor in Ujjain. And then finally, he became ruler. So he had his time here. And when he decided to convert to Buddhism or support Buddhism, he put monuments in this entire region, all the way to South India, that everyone should follow the precepts of the Buddha. And you should be peaceful and obey your parents and not kill animals and follow all of these rules. So he promoted Buddhism throughout this whole region. He sent missionaries to Egypt, he sent them to China, he sent them to the entire known world to promote Buddhism. And it's during this time period that we see writing emerging again. So the Indus Valley had writing, and then for almost a thousand years there was no writing because the Vedic people memorized their texts, they had oral traditions, and they didn't write things down. They did that intentionally to avoid people knowing this, this, the sacred um, chants that you have to have for rituals. So the earliest writing is found actually in Sri Lanka on pottery, inscribed on pottery. And this is found by traders that were trading things to the temples in, in Anuradha Pura in Sri Lanka. Ashokan edicts were written in Brahmi, an, an invented script that was probably invented from some uh, nearby uh, syllabary. And that became used to write many of these monuments. But there were people who didn't read Brahmi. So they wrote them in Greek as well. They wrote them in Kharoshti as well. So they wrote these uh, edicts in multiple languages. And we know that the scribes who inscribed these were also people who spoke different languages, because a scribe might have inscribed it in Brahmi, but he signed it in Karoshti, because he was actually brought 
to, what, to make an inscription in another part of the subcontinent. So some of the inscriptions in South India or in Central India were signed by somebody writing a different language. So it indicates the overlapping language, language issue already present in this region. And just a curiosity, we have evidence for the first zero starting in Sharada Brahmi from the late Kushana period. So this is found on a birch bark manuscript found in a village near Peshawar called Bakshali. And recent dating with carbon dating of the ink has shown that it dates to the third or fourth century BC, CE. So this is the Kushana period when we have the earliest zero. It's right there. That's a zero. Um, we start seeing writing being used on seals. And I would argue that some of this might be actually linked to Indus Valley seals. People had seen those seals, and they used similar forms. We have sometimes bulls and oxen, but not, no unicorn. The unicorn disappeared. This is just to compare Greek coins with the early punch mark coins that were used by the Mauryan period. So the Mauryan people didn't put their face on the coin. They used geometric mandala shapes or designs, stamps. And each city-state had their own unique style. But they did have a common weight system. So the things that we can link with the Indus Valley is that the weight system of the early historic cities is identical to the weight system used by the Indus people. So although some of the ide ideological traditions like the unicorn and the seals themselves disappear and the writing disappears, the merchants continued, the everyday life continued, and certain aspects of trade continued on into the later time period. We have texts such as the Arthashastra, which talk about the different crafts. And these crafts are highly diverse. And among them, we have stone carving. So this carving was much earlier than the so-called Gandhara art. The idea that Greeks brought sculpture tradition to South Asia, which is sometimes seen in the early uh, art history books, is totally bogus. Um, the people had been carving stone for a long time in South Asia, from the Indus Valley on. And we have traditions of large sculptures of deities already made. This is probably a giant uh, deity. During the Mauryan period, we have evidence of uh, really elaborate stone carving being used. And then the Mauryan uh, rulers borrowed some symbols from Iran, because you know Iran was there. People had interacted. They probably had been to Persepolis. And in Persepolis, the Achaemenid rulers had big pillars, and on top of that, a lion. So why not do that for us, too? So this lion, which is a symbol of India today, a four-headed lion with the dharma uh, um, chakra, where the wheel of law, is you know co combined motifs from many different regions, but carved with Indian style on a big column, highly polished, and also we have bulls put on the top. And this bull is South Asian, so this bull was domesticated in Mahavagar and continued through the Indus Valley, the hump to Zebu. And just to throw in a little bit of connection to Harappa, in our excavations at Harappa, um, we were able to actually go to the museum and pull out all the things that were excavated by the earlier excavators. And this one piece had been found, and they called it a grinding stone or a turtle. I pulled it out, and the photographs are really bad, and they're black and white, and they're very smudged, and you can't see what they are. When I pulled it out and looked at it, I saw this is not a turtle. This is the haunch of a large bull sculpture made of stone. It's been reused as a grinding stone later and a pounding mortar later, but the outside shows the front part of a large bull. This would have been three times as big as the one that's on top of the Mauryan capital. And this dates to earlier than the Mauryan period at Harappa. So it means that these stone sculpture traditions were already present in the late phases of the Harappan and er, the early historic period at Harappa, probably pre-Mauryan, and then later became refined during the Mauryan period. We know that the Mauryan terracotta tradition is very rich. They had very beautiful terracottas. These were probably brightly painted. So they are plain clay now, but they probably were painted with post-firing pigments because the later designs have a lot of um, ornaments, ornaments on them. And so what is Gandharan? Today, most people saw Gandharan art, and they compare it with an art called Matra, or you know, the Matra style, which is central Gangetic style. So this is a Matra style carving with red sandstone. 
And this is a Gandhara style carving with gray schist. And I'm not sure why this happened, but I am going to attribute it to colonialism because European scholars that were coming, British, French, German, etc., coming to South Asia, probably couldn't relate to Matra style. It's not quite right. But when they looked at this, they said Greek. It looks like Greek sculpture. It looks classical. And so they made a big deal of Gandhara sculpture and said that the Greek influence came and totally modified it. I don't agree with that because there's some Greek elements in here. There are definitely some elements of Greek style of decoration. But basically, we have no sculptures of Greeks with halos on them. We have no sculptures of Greeks with all these ornaments on them. Greek sculptures were often totally naked, and then they were clothed with textiles. So a very different way of presenting things. So I think a totally new approach needs to be done to understanding what is Gandhara and what is not. We do know that many so-called um, myths or stories from various religious traditions became embodied in the art. This is a weight lifting thing. So if you lift weights and you say, Krishna, 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 you know Krishna was very strong. And there's a picture of Krishna destroying a, a daemon a horse. So this is a way that you can link your weight lifting and gym work to an ideology. We also have, this is work done by Dr. Abdul Samad. He's just published a book on the origins of Hindu iconography in Gandhara. There are more images of Shiva and Maheshwara and Uma in Taxilan art than anywhere else. These are the places where these images begin. We have pictures of Varaha, which is the incarnation of Vishnu. Pictures of Garuda capturing a maiden. Now Garuda is associated with Zeus capturing Ganymede, a boy, that then is now translated into Garuda, which is the vehicle of Vishnu capturing a female. Uh, so totally different interpretation. And then Skanda Kumara, who's the son of Shiva, which is also, these are symbols that we're seeing in Gandharan art that usually get glossed over. People focus on the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas, but not all of these other images. And then all of the household shrines. There are hundreds and hundreds of household shrines that show deities and mainly goddesses that were worshipped in the home. These are made of clay. And each of them reflect local traditions that are being preserved in the household and passed on. So I just wanted to kind of elaborate that there's a lot more to Gandhara than just some just sculptures that have been highlighted because they kind of look Greek and that links us to this Mediterranean ethos. Dharmarajika is also such an important site because it is a site that has been rebuilt and rebuilt and rebuilt many times. It was founded by Ashoka at about 250 BC. We don't know which structures are built by Ashoka. They are probably underneath the center of this. The main stupa was looted, so they took the relics from the inside. But we have lots of smaller stupas around it that were not looted. And some of those had tiny little votive um, containers. There's one downstairs that I put in the gift shop, an example, that had ashes in them. And some of those were inscribed saying, these are the ashes of the Buddha. So when the Buddha died, his ashes were first divided into eight separate piles. And then those were buried in eight sacred places. But then Ashoka decided, I'm going to unbury all those, and I'm going to make them and put them into tiny little things of the size of a pill capsule and send them everywhere in the world. So he took the thing the size of a pill capsule, put a little bit of ash in each one, and then sent, they were made of gold. And he sent those everywhere. And so lots of rulers got a little bit of ash from the Buddha. And then they would donate it back to Dharma Rajika. So that's what these stupas are. So in Banaras, uh, in Sarnath, Sarnath stupa was destroyed by a later king. He destroyed the ashes of the Buddha, he threw it all in the Ganges River. So when Sarnath was being rebuilt by the Archaeological Survey of India. They were just excavating Dharma Rajika. They found one of these votive stupas. And one of them was in size that said, this is the ashes of the Buddha. So they decided, we're going to take this ash and take it to Sarnath. So that ash from Dharma Rajika, from a small stupa, was sent to Sarnath. Another ash was sent to Sri Lanka. So these are things that, have, that you probably aren't familiar with, but as how the 
the idea of the Buddha and the ashes continued to be sent around. These stupas had lots of beads put in them. People put ornaments. This is this one in Sa Sa Sanchi. And we see them today as stone sculptures, but they were not just plain stone. They were probably decorated with gold, like we see today. So this is, stupa was built in Kathmandu in 464 CE during the late phase of this time period. And you see it's heavily painted. They paint it every year. This is an example of the Kushinagara stupa, which was first set by Ashoka. And we have also a Buddha laying in Mahaparinirvana. So Mahaparinirvana is the Buddha when he loses his earthly body. He already had attained an enlightenment. So you can't die again, OK? Only your body dies. But when his body died, this is called the, the Pari Nirvana. Pari Nirvana means it's going, going into Nirvana. And this is the Maha Pari Nirvana. And I like to throw, show this picture of Minakshi Temple in South India. This is what those stupas probably looked like. They were painted with the richest and the brightest colors that people could have. And they were painted every year because the monsoons washes it off and you have to repaint it. So part of the worship is to pay for the repainting of the stupa and it would be done every year. And we know that these sculptures were painted because we have examples of them, very few. This was the one, this is the one in the Lahore Museum that's been kind of very garishly re reconserved. This is one from um, the Asian Art Museum here in Chicago, you can go and see it and another one, and these still have the paint there. This is one from Mesainak in Afghanistan, a stone one painted with the gold, or the red, and then wooden ones, which were also painted. And they're decorated with these jewels, which you cannot see unless they've been painted. So these things were probably faceted and very, very highly polished, and decorated to make look, them look like the real objects, which were gold. And so this is where I come to Bamala Stupa, where I was able to work with Dr. Samad, Dr. Shakirula, and Dr. Hamid. So Taxila is here, and Bamala is located on a small river called the Haro River, which is the path to Kashmir. So Taxila and Kashmir are linked through this river. You go over the top, and you cross the hill, and you're in Kashmir. And Bamala Stupa itself is a large cruciform or stepped cross stupa with a monastery. and Marshall, John Marshall in 1929 um, excavated this area and this part of this area, but he left this large room unexcavated because he thought it was too badly looted. This is a view of the stupa. They've been cleaning it and uh, updating it, and then this is the room that Marshall did not excavate. Uh, in their surface clearing, they found that seal that I showed you. So most people don't pay a lot of attention to tiny little objects, and I do. So I, we analyzed it. It's a special type of garnet found from northern Pakistan. And it's also engraved with a style of carving that's not Greek. It's carved in a style that is very different from the Greek style of carving. And it's carved with Lakshmi, an Indian Hindu goddess, who is also a, a Buddhist deity, being bathed by two elephants in a very South Asian form. Um, the shape has been likened to, uh, there's other examples of this that have been found. And many people argue that they took the style from Greek and Roman seals that were showed a victory or a deity. And maybe they did, but the carving style itself is, is slightly different. So it suggests that there are local carvers developing their own technology to, 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 to manufacture these. The excavation of this room is when I became really excited about this site because it happened over a couple of years, and I watched them, and I helped them document it. I trained some of the students in mapping and how to excavate it. And I kept coming back and watching it, and they exposed the room. We found lots of terracotta sculptures that had been along the wall. The looters had torn them apart because they were looking for coins, and they scraped off the gold leaf that was on the outside. And they, this is Hamid standing on top of what he thought was a wall to photograph it. And then we look at the front of the wall, and it's made of limestone pieces that have been carved. After cleaning the whole thing, we realized that this is actually a reclining Buddha. It's an entire structure of a reclining Buddha that is 15 meters long. It's the largest sculpture ever found
from South Asia at this time period. And it was made of carved soft stone covered with plaster that was then painted and then covered with probably gold leaf, the whole thing. So that image I showed you earlier was probably what it looked like. Marshall had found one image of the Nirvana from the big stupa, they made in stucco. It's in the Peshawar Museum today. They found more stupas behind this chamber that had smaller ones, so we know what the shape would have looked like. So I made a drawing that reconstructed what that Buddha would have looked like. So this is the reconstruction based on the smaller stucco images of what that massive sculpture would look like. And this is the largest and the earliest, we can date it, Mahaparibhanirvana in South Asia. And it's after this that other regions started developing the tradition, and then also even in Afghanistan, the huge standing Buddhas, and they have a sleeping Buddha there too. The other thing which was interesting was the terracotta sculptures around it. So terracotta art has not been given a lot of attention for Gandhara, and I think that this has been overlooked. So Hamid here is excavating a head of a sculpture. That head is lying underneath the torso of the same sculpture. So you can imagine the looters coming into this room, seeing these beautiful sculptures covered with gold leaf, and knocking off the head. You see coins in here, because people would bury coins inside them. Nope, knock off the torso, no coins in here. Leave the legs, and so we found the legs attached to the wall, the torso on the ground, and the head underneath the torso. So we can reconstruct these things to see what they would have been like. We can also see that they were made with a piece of wood on the inside, wrapped in cloth, so it's still burned and preserved, and then wrapped with coarse clay, and then fine clay, and then plaster, and then paint, and then gold leaf. So we can see the whole construction process of how these were done. We presented this at a conference in Europe, and some of my art history colleagues were not very happy with me because they said all of the ancient sculptures were made of clay, they were not fired. And these are examples found in Hadda and other places in Afghanistan that have been looted and sold to big museums like the Musée Guimet, and they claim that they're clay. But I think they're actually fired clay because clay itself is very soft. We do have some clay sculptures from Messinac, um, and this may have been a, a later tradition, but the earlier ones that we have here are definitely fired. So I asked one of my friends, Iftikhar Emmet. He was the one who carved the two sculptures downstairs. He and his father came to the Smithsonian to demonstrate Gandhara carving. His grandfather had been hired by Marshall to repair Gandhara sculptures, and that's how this whole tradition started. So they were hired to try to shape and, and fix the ones that were kind of broken, and then replace parts that were missing so they could put them in the museum. And Iftikhar helped by starting with a piece of wood, wrapping it with cloth, mixing his coarse clay, and eventually this is what you have. You have a whole process of building from coarse to this fine surface, and we decided to paint it with red ochre and lime plaster, and then we fired it. So the whole group is here, as in the winter, it's kind of cold, and we did a quick firing. This is a way to fire something really hot quickly and then take it out because the inside is unfired. The, some of the wood was still unfired inside or just charred inside these sculptures. So we tried to replicate that. And part of one head blew up, but the other head was, was, was okay. I, we didn't let them dry enough. They need to dry a bit longer. Um, so this is an example of it before firing and then this is after firing. So this is an example of what those, how that art might have been produced. And uh, Iftikhar is continuing to work with the department, helping to conserve sculptures like his grandfather. And I asked him to help reconstruct what an ancient Gandharan stupa and sculpture would look like for the museum at Taxila uh, University of Kaidiazm University. So this is in there, the Taxila Institute for Asian Civilizations in Kaidiazm. And we built a wall of what it would look like on the edge of a stupa. We only plastered part of it. And I'm having the students, we're going to be, when I go back after COVID, we're going to be grinding down pigments of lapis and ochre, and then we will paint it with different designs. And we will install these Buddha sculptures, but they will also be painted. So they're going to be totally painted. So in conclusion, the importance of Gandhara and Taxila, uh, it sees the development of a number of innovative trends. 
and styles that start from the Mauryan period, culminating during the Kushana period. And these, the things that we see are predating stuff found in the areas around it. So the colossal sizes of images of Buddha, stepped across stupas, earliest representations of Buddha with double halo, and you can add lots of different deities from different religious traditions. <clears throat> and also, finally, the use of fire and painted terracotta, which in the past people said they just painted clay. We now know that they had this special technique for making terracotta that was more permanent and long-lasting. So thank you very much.